So hello everyone. Thank you for joining on our video once again. Um, I have the pleasure of having Dr. Jay Wilson with us to answer a couple of questions. Welcome. Hey, hey how's it going everybody? <laughs> Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us today. Um, we are very excited to hear about your journey um, as a UAG alum who has successfully matched. Um, yes, congratulations. And we really want to um, just to add, know a little bit more about you and what um, you did to get to where you are and somehow so we can learn from your experiences and actually match as well. <laughs> so let's get started with the first question. It's a little bit about yourself. Um, can you just tell us a little bit of um, where you're from and where did you go into undergrad? Um, so I'm originally from the Midwest, Omaha, Nebraska. Go Cornhuskers. And as like most people from Nebraska, as soon as I graduated, I was ready to go. Um, so I was not originally a science major. I actually did not want to do anything medicine when I went to college. I didn't even think, I was like, oh, who's in medicine? So I went to a, a small Christian school in Georgia, to Coral Falls College. Um, after my first year, I, I, I thought I was going to be a humanitarian worker. I wanted to travel the world and just help people however I could. So um, then I realized that private school is expensive. So between my, after my first year of college, um, I joined the military and I wanted to work on cars. Um, but the recruiter told me there was a $20,000 bonus to be a combat medic. So I said, sign me up. I love medicine. And that's kind of where I fell in, fell in love with medicine. I was like, man, I love, I love the adrenaline. I love figuring things out. It's like, hey, this is happening. What do you do? And I knew this is what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to do something with medicine. So um, after that, I went back and I finished my first degree, but I had zero science classes. I was a liberal arts. Science scared me. So... Um, I kind of wanted to do two birds in one stone. And so I went to San Juan, Puerto Rico and, and did all my science classes at La Inter. And they were in Spanish and it was, it was hard, but it was fun. And um, from there I went to La Tonoma. Wow, that's amazing. So that's kind of how you um, knew or learned about UAG by being mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. Yep, UAG is, they've got everything everywhere. And everyone at La Inter, you know, the science, we were like this, we all knew about La Autonoma. Oh, wow, that's awesome. That's so cool. It's 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 like a um, very diverse background that you that you have. But I do know some um, military um, people in, in UAG. So that's really cool because, you know, people are out there, it's just, we don't know, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to see everyone's story, especially when they're all asking you. And you guys will get there, you'll have um, people like, hey, can you read my essay to make sure how it looks? And you're like, oh. That's awesome. Um, okay, so in terms of UAG, when did you start UAG? Would it, was it August or January and why? Um, I started UAG in December. So I didn't quite finish my science classes to apply for um, the regular US cycle. So I thought, um, so when I finished up at La Inter and I had all my, my pre-med sciences, I kind of had a decision. I really wanted to stay in a Spanish speaking. Um, I did really like Mexico. I thought it'd be kind of an adventure to live there. And so I thought, do I wait a year and apply to US schools, right? And there's no guarantee you get in, or do I just say, let's go to La Donoma? And so I got there, I said, when can I start? And they said, December. And so, yeah, that's kind of it. I mean, I probably should have started sooner, but I was in December. No, I was just ready to start. When did you, when did you graduate? Yeah, so I just graduated December of 2020. Awesome. So I had a gap year in between graduating and starting residency. Okay, okay, we'll talk about your ERAS and, and stuff later, but okay, a gap year is good. 
And um, so congratulations on your match. I you. wanted um, to ask you, where did you match and what did you match into? Yep. So I matched into internal medicine at the Brooklyn Hospital. So I will be in New York City for the next three years. Yep. And kind of part of when you're looking for programs, not only are you looking for kind of what you want to match into, but also look for fellowships if you want to go on. So this hospital has a really good palm crit uh, program and they only take their own residents. So I'm on my way to be an ICU doctor. Awesome, that's really cool. So how long is um, internal medicine and that fellowship? Yep. So you will be, so internal medicine at my program is gonna be three years. And then after that, it's kind of like applying to residency again. Everyone that wants to do fellowships applies for it and you kind of see if you get in or not. So there's no guarantee, but that's kind of what I'm hoping for. Oh, and I also wanted to say, um, it's completely okay. You are gonna change, once you get to your third year and fourth year, you're probably gonna change what you wanna do. Or maybe you stay the same and you fall in love with it. But I was a, originally a hardcore, I was gonna be an ER doctor. I was like, I love ER doctors, the lifestyle's fun. But then I kind of got cold feet my fourth year. I thought I kind of want more patient follow-up, I want more theory, I want more labs. So I kind of went middle of the road and was like, I'm gonna do internal medicine, but then do ICU to kind of get the middle ground between those two. You know what, it's funny that you mentioned um, that you wanted to do ER because based off of just the little that I know you right now, I was like, oh, he seems like he would pursue ER, but it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I almost did, I almost did, it was. <laughs> That's cool, but it's it's honestly just following what what you ultimately want. Could you speak a little bit about what is, um, what what is like the ICU and home, home crit? Yeah, so, um, so internal medicine is, basically hospital medicine. And it's kind of the springboard into everything that's in the hospital. So if you wanna work in the ICU, so I mean, there's family practitioner doctors that work in the ICU. They're just not kind of gonna be the expert doctor there, right? I mean, you can, you can branch off and kind of shape medicine however you want to with like family medicine, ER, um, internal medicine. But internal medicine is kind of like the gateway into the hospital. So when you guys are on your third year, you'll be following cardiologists, pulmonologists, endocrinology. Um, so kind of if you think like uh, Gray's Anatomy or Scrubs, that's kind of internal medicine. It's the doctors making the rounds, taking care of the patients. It's also the best medicine out there. <laughs> yes, of course. Best specialty. Um, in terms of extracurriculars during medical school, um, what were yours? My, I was actually, um, I think some of my friends probably paid people. I was the president of my class. So I was the president of my class that semester. Um, and then kind of springboarding off of that, I became the president of AMSA my second year. And I also volunteered with, you guys still work with D-Medic? Yes. Yes, I love Dr. Rezuhe. <laughs> She's amazing. But yeah, so, and they were awesome. And honestly, I can't tell you how much every single interview I did, they all asked about D-Medic. They were like, so what was that, like going out to the countryside like? Like, how was, like, that's awesome that you gotta do that in your first year. So like your extracurriculars kind of, they do, do give you a little bit of a bonus when you're going to match. It's also just something to kind of talk about in your interviews and connect with people and kind of stand out. Like once you get the interview, it's like, why should I take this applicant versus this applicant? And those extracurriculars that you guys are doing or that research that you get into or research projects over the summer is really gonna help you stand out in those interviews. In terms of research, did you do any during medical school? Yes. So I wish I did. I wish I did and I'm kicking myself for not. So when you're in medical school, find those opportunities, find anything, even if you don't publish. Um, so on my ERAS system, and it's been this way for a long time, so it'll probably be the same when you guys get there, there's a box. Did you do research? Yes or no, right? So if you apply and you don't have any research, you click no. The thing is, 
what they're doing is it's so competitive. They're really pushing kind of like doctor scientists. They want to see, can you do research or can you run clinical trials? So I didn't have any of that when I graduated. There just weren't the opportunities at UAG and I didn't go looking for them in the summers, um, which I probably should have, you know, but medical school's so busy. You're worried about all the exams, neuro block, learning how to listen to the heart. Um, so in my gap year, I actually worked in clinical trials. Um, but if you do have a gap year, even though you have an MD, you can't work as an MD until you do residency. So um, if anyone out there is thinking, oh, I'll just work as a generalist, you cannot do that. There is no such thing as a generalist without a residency. Um, I think in three states, you can work as like a PA, um, but the pay is horrible. Like I think they pay like 50 or 60. You're not, it's not that good. So try and get in on time. So. Gotcha. No, yes. Um... I totally get it. I personally was looking for research opportunities over the summer, but also you have to take into consideration that we're USIMGs, so that's also like a barrier. You know, you just have to keep on trying because a lot of the opportunities are very like US central. So <laughs> yeah. All right, we keep it for US students or we want a US student. Yes, yes. In terms of mentors, um, did you have any? And if so, how did you find him or her? Um, so I actually did not really have a, a mentor per se. Um, a lot of it, um, as far as like how the process works, just talking to other medical students. And when you're on your when you're on your third and fourth year, a lot of those attendings you'll have they love students, and so you can ask them about the medicine and ask what they think about it and ask what their advice is. Um, so um, I did not have a mentor, but I mean it would have been nice to have one. I think, but. Um, you're going to be around doctors all the time, third and fourth year, and a lot of them are really friendly. So. Okay, so in terms of clinical rotations, um, third year, you you do your core clinical rotations, and I was just wondering, where did you go, and did you stay there for your entire third year? Um, so I was, I think, one of a handful of people who, I stayed in Mexico for my third year um, so I was given a tip by one of the there was a Puerto Rican professor uh, Dr. Aviles she taught statistics biostatistics and ethics at the La Donoma um, but she said do your third year in Mexico and I will say in my opinion I think that was um, a really good choice I've got way more hands-on I saw way more pathologies than most of my friends who went to the US. Um, so kind of the thing is, in Mexico, you are at some of the best hospitals to be at. Um, whereas um, in the US, UAG doesn't have very good rotations, right? Or they're not, they're not as good as US students. Some of the attendings don't care. Um, I know that there's some bad locations and I'm sure as a you know have you put in your rotations already or where you want to go or? I'm currently um, on the fence but I think I'm going to decide to go to Vegas yeah. I'm sure you guys are all talking oh that's a bad location or that's a good one or oh that's where the slackers go <laughs> if you stay in Mexico right you get I mean the rotations the experience that I got in Mexico was phenomenal the attendings were some of the best uh, doctors in Mexico and during surgery I got to do so much in surgery like it was just awesome like my surgery I, I do not want to be a surgeon I hated surgery I was like but it was it was an awesome experience in surgery I learned to suture well and it was just a great experience even though I don't want to be a surgeon it was incredible to see that much medicine so my entire third year was done at uh, some of the best hospitals uh, in Mexico and actually um, if you are wanting to do family medicine, primary care, emergency medicine, I would really recommend, uh, the hospital I did was the, the they called it Hospitalito, uh, Hospital General de Zapopan. And it's a smaller hospital, but you get so much hands-on experience. That's good to know because, um, you know, the question is always, do I stay in Mexico for the hands-on experience that you will get here? Um, or do you go to the U.S. because of, you know, um, the healthcare system and also letters of recommendation? 
but I mean, you matched, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. So I did my fourth year actually in San Antonio, and I did one uh, uh, elective, a visiting elective at Tucson. Um, so kind of how to match, right? So the matching algorithm is basically, the biggest one is your exam scores, right? That's how they figure out. They get, I think I saw one program emailed me, and this is actually a rejection letter from a program. It was like somewhere in like Miami, but they said, um, da, 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 you're very qualified. However, we want to tell you, we're not gonna be looking at your, you know, uh, furthering with you. We get 1,700 applications for 17 spots. So. They've got to figure out because everyone applies to like a hundred programs. So they got to figure out who really wants to go here or who do we really want here? How do we, we have everyone applying, who do we give our interviews to? Um, but kind of the process for that and why I talk about Mexico versus the US, you need at least a year. Most programs say you need one year, right? So most programs will say, hey, if you did Mexico for four years, we, we're not even going to look at you. Like that's a way to get you out. Most programs say we want at least one year. Also, um, besides your your scores, your your letters of recommendation are huge, right? So, um, basically, and the, and the thing is, what I've heard her residents say about that, and heard some um, what they told us in interviews, is that letters of recommendation let them from U.S. doctors let them know who you are. So, this is somebody who we know has a medical license. What does he think about you? because they don't know you, they like, hey, maybe they're just interview well. So what are these LORs telling us? Um, I actually should have probably gotten some um, Mexican doctors to write LORs for me. Um, because if you just have international only, they don't care. But if you have US doctors and now Mexico doctors saying the same thing, it's, it's kind of good. I actually got, um, one of the doctors asked me, she's like, why didn't you have any, um, uh, letters of recommendation from Mexico and I was like oh I just didn't think they counted you know I guess I told her I was like yeah I, I didn't think it was a bother a good idea to get those and um, she was like oh okay but she told me it would have been so if oh. you do stay in Mexico I would I would get at least one LOR so you can kind of say hey here's my three from the US here's one Mexico doctor letting you know how my rotations were there Thank you for that insight because um, I also thought that they wouldn't matter, you know? So that's kind of why I decided from the get-go just go to the U.S., you know? So, yeah, so, I mean, your U.S. ones are the gold standard, but yeah, they, they help a little bit, those, those Mexican doctors. Well, you kind of spoke about your fourth year already. You went to Texas, mm -hmm. but you also did an away rotation. Did you apply for that or is that um, through, uh, through UAG? Yeah. So um, it was kind of uh, uh, kind of a mixture of everything. Um, my rotation site, San Antonio, actually got closed down like for the start of the semester. So like I was in San Antonio, da da da, everything's good, and then I think like a week before. Uh, it started, they said, sorry, you're canceled. You have to find somewhere else. Um, so um, I was like, let's go to Tucson. That's available. They've got ER. It sounds good. So. Oh, OK, OK. Um, yes. I've heard of that where the because we no longer have associations with um, hospitals in Texas. So maybe you were part of that transitional period. Yeah, I was I was one of the class that got caught in that and had to leave Texas. So mm, okay, okay. I was just wondering because there's um, away rotations that some people might do, and I I thought maybe you applied through VSAS, the like visiting away rotation. Yeah. So so I did I did try for VSAS, and what you'll also find is an international programs don't really want to take you. There's very few programs that are like hey, we kind of we fill up. And we want to take U.S. students before we do IMGs or some. I even had some programs write me like, sorry, we don't have the space for IMGs to rotate here. And so if it's not through UAG, you're going to find that it's very, very hard to find programs that'll take you. Some programs don't take any IMGs. I say, sorry, we don't take IMGs. So for your fourth year, do you remember what electives you selected? Yep. So I did, my first one was ENT. So I kind of like... I was kind of still, when I started fourth year, I wanted to apply to emergency medicine. So I was like, 
Um, I did ENT in the U.S. in San Antonio, anesthesiology, infectious disease. Um, I did an ER elective, and I think my fifth one was neurology. Awesome. So you basically repeated because in the third year you do ER, but then you have the opportunity to do emergency medicine again. I actually, um, so it must have recently changed then. So uh, when I was in, we needed to do emergency medicine, but it was in our fourth year, you know, whenever you wanted to. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, or it might be for U.S. students because for us, they, I think they already had everything set up with the Mexican hospital. So it's like you don't have a choice what you take your third year, and then your fourth year you got to do ER and somewhere in there. Oh, okay. The way that we do it right now is we apply semester by semester, and we kind of set, um, I guess, 24 credits aside, and one of those options is ER. So that's why I I was like, oh, maybe you repeated because I've heard that you know especially for er i don't know why but you can redo emergency medicine in your fourth year maybe in a diff under a different preceptor or maybe um in a different hospital I i'm not really sure of the process so i thought maybe you did that yep. so how it, how it went for us is you can do any rotation up to three times um so actually i i i I probably should have done internal medicine more, but I know some people who are like, hey, I wanted to do internal medicine and they end up doing internal medicine here, internal medicine there, internal medicine there. And some of them are like, hey, I just want to do internal or neurology. So then they like end up doing neurology at the same clinic in the same city. So um, when we went through, it was three. But as far as UAG goes, you know, it could change on a dime. Yes, of course. It's always. Uh being proactive about what's the latest <laughs> with you, AJ. In terms of step one, <laughs> when did you take step one and um, what resources did you use and would you recommend them? Yeah, so uh, step word, you just said the S word. I'm scared, <laughs> giving me nightmares. Um, no, so I took the step one my seventh semester. Mm -hmm. And so kind of my thought process on, on UAG in this step is, is this. So I wanted to finish it when U.S. students did. So during your fourth semester, at least during mine, they were giving us an extended, like you got out early your fourth semester. So we would finish like six, seven weeks early. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like, that's supposed to be a dedicated study where you're studying 13, 14 hours a day, every day for the steps so that you can take it at that end of six to eight weeks. Um, I got cold feet. I did not take it. I paid for it. I registered. Um, I was nervous about getting it. I got cold feet, so I did not take it after fourth semester. Um, I wanted to study a little more. And kind of the thing um, is, is UAG students and, and looking back now is, is a soon to be uh, resident in a couple months. Um, and, you know, passing both the boards. Um, I did rock star them. I got about, I did average on the MCAT, average on this, on both steps. So if you want a rock star, this might not be the best advice, but if you want to get a, a pretty good score, that'll keep you competitive in most specialties. Um, I think this will help you guys. But the thing about US students is from day one, they have specialists, you know, who are teaching them this medicine and going over it and prepping them how to think. And it's really hard to know what to study or what to look for or the depth you need to know things or even how to think about things. You know, if you don't know, if I don't tell you, you know, hey, why is it important to know ALT, ASD? What's the differential if you have an elevated those two, but your ALK FOSS is elevated? What's it mean if your ALK FOSS is elevated and your liver enzymes are normal? You know, what organs is that affecting? And if someone doesn't tell you to look for that or explain that to you and say, well, hey, is it in the biliary tree? Is it a blockage in the pancreas? Is, are you having hepatitis, cirrhosis, right? You won't be looking for those things when you're reading the text. And so as UAG students, and as, as I think there were only out of my class, uh, we started with like a hundred. I think by the time we got to rotations, we were about 40 of us. And I think that, that 40 from my class, so the 40% of us who made it to the third year on time, I only think like a handful of them took the step after fourth semester. And I actually still have some friends who are now a year and a half outside of 
of graduating and they have not taken step one, they just cannot get cold feet. But um, kind of going back to that, a lot of UAG students, we have to use that third year to kind of fill in those gaps. So once you kind of start doing a lot of U-World questions, you'll kind of see where those gaps are. You'll think, oh, I hate biostatistics. I never learned this and now I have to. You'll realize I really have to understand EKGs, imaging. I really have to memorize these things. So um, as far as a UAG student goes, it's kind of harder for us to learn because we don't have those expert professors kind of showing us how it's supposed to be done and how US doctors think. So I took step one, I ended up, you know, learning by bio, relearning biochemistry, relearning statistics, going over histology and really getting it um, so that I could at least get a, a decently competitive step one score. What did you use to, to study? What worked for you? Okay, so my, my, golden, my golden list of what you want for step one. So um, the first thing is um, kind of what is step one, right? So when I took it, it was graded, right? Now it's changing to pass fail, which takes a little bit of the edge off, but it's still a hard test to pass. So basically the step is 50% theory, right? Do you understand what's going on in medicine? Do you understand heart failure? If your heart's failing, what effect does that have on your kidneys? What are you gonna look for in lab work? What enzymes are going to be elevated? What does that do to the lungs? How is that patient gonna present? How, you know, what if the patient's older or younger? Will that affect any risk of cancer? Will that affect their mental abilities? What medications are you going to give? What side effects do those have? If you don't kind of understand how all those things interact, you're gonna have a little bit of hard time with STEM. The second half is going to be you just have to rote memorization. You just have to know, inner, and you're gonna forget it after like, you know, you get to, um, some of my friends are like, hey, you wanna do some step one questions? Like, no, I forgot some of that stuff that doesn't matter anymore. Like, like what, uh, what, <laughs> what enzymes does this acinophil release when it's drinking Mountain Dew? Zero idea, zero idea. But those are stuff that the step one will ask you. They'll be like, you have a person with allergies, where did this, uh, the most likely cell responsible for this, what is their favorite restaurant? And you're like, shoot, I forgot what their favorite restaurant is. But I, I just, you, there's no rhyme, you just have to memorize those. So, and then the last 5%, and I know that adds up to 105%, that's just because the step is so hard, is you gotta know things like imaging, right? You have to be able to know how to read an X-ray, how to read a CT, how to read common MRIs, how to read common ultrasound images because those are going to come up on the step. You have to know histology. You have to know the, how to describe those histologies. So, and you have to listen to heart sounds. Like on mine, there was like an image in it and the question hinged on, can you correctly interpret where this heart sound is and what, what sound it was? You know, so that's definitely gonna come on the steps. You kind of have to be prepared for those things. So as far as like the theory goes, right? Um, you wanna just absorb as much as you can in your first two years, right? Because when you're studying for STEP, um, you know, and this is what a lot of UAG students, there's just too many holes that they fill in, right? But as far as resources go, you've got first aid. That is like the Bible, Every almost everyone uses it. It's awesome, right? Then you've got UWorld, right? That is my step one felt like I was doing eight blocks of U World. Like if you would have said which one's U World and which one's the step, zero idea. I'd have been like, they're both about dead on. You got sketchy for microbiology. You've got pathoma, which is really good to review um, pathology. I watched a lot of pathoma studying for step one. It's like, oh that, okay, that's reviewing. It's like just seeing it multiple times. There's another really good book um, I don't know if you guys seen it, but it's the Deja Review series. And it's basically a really good way to kind of get that rote memorization down. So it's basically just like a cheat sheet list of everything you need to memorize for step one, or a majority of the things you need to memorize. So it'll have like in one corner, it'll say, list the antibiotic needed for this. And then it'll be like E. coli. And then on the right, it will tell you what, 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 um, 
you know, medications or what antibiotics are, you know, usually your first lines for that medication. Then, um, something that I did, I got this tip from my uncle. I would, I would go to UWorld and all the little charts that it has to remember, I recorded my voice. And so when I was riding my bike or running or at the gym, I would turn those voice memos on and listen to myself just saying these things to memorize, you know? So it'd be like um, statins and um, the one that starts with an F for, um, I'm forgetting the name right now, but okay, those cause rhabdomyolysis. And I would just say those things on repeat to kind of just help myself continue to remember those. Um, another really good option that you guys have for part of that just rote memorization if you haven't started using Firecracker or Anki cards and Anki deck, I would really recommend getting those. Um, Anki decks are free. You can find them online, but some people put out some like Anki deck and it'll have like 400, like 400 cards in this deck and you just go through it. You know, the most high yield things that you're probably going to see to kind of drill those into your head. And Firecracker is really good too, because that's kind of a way to be like, okay, um, it's drilling this into my head. And if you see anything you're unfamiliar with, you can read about it and be like, okay, that's a pathology I might not have seen or don't remember seeing. And then you can go learn it at that point in time. Um, so those were those were everything I used. Um, but probably first aid and UWorld are the highest yield out of all of those. I've never heard of the book that you mentioned about memorizing. What, what, what was that called again? Yeah, so it's called Deja, Deja. Review. Okay. Um, and the, the book is USMLE step one, but they have one for step one, step two, they've got one for biochemistry, physiology. So in terms of step two, um, you took CS and CK? So I actually hit the point where I was going to take CS, um, but then they canceled it. They canceled CS and they wrote, they've now since replaced it with a, um, basically an English exam, the, uh, the OET. It's an English test. Everyone who is a native English speaker passes, but you have to take it because we're international students. So in terms of um, step two CK, um, did you use the same resources? No, so I actually did not. As far as step two goes, um, it's a little, you still have a lot of theory, but it's not, it's more treatment and workup versus medical theory. So step one is all medical theory. It can ask you anything. It can ask you um, what is the color of hair with someone with um, Taco Bell addiction? And you'll have to know the color of their hair, right? Um, whereas step two is more, it doesn't care about that. It's like, listen, I don't care. I don't care what interleukins and a sinophil release is. I mean, it, it still kind of does, but it's not, at that level, it's not at the biochemistry. Do you know where you're at in the Krebs cycle? It's a lot more workup. So step two really asks you a lot about pathology. Can you diagnose? And do you know where you're at? And do you know what to order next? Do you know, are you in an inpatient setting? Are you in the ER? Hey, this is your bug. What antibiotic are you gonna give? This is your disease what are you going to give for it? That's failed. What are you going to give next? So you really got to know those algorithms. Hey, this person's CT was normal, but there's still a high suspicion they have something. Are they good? Or do you have to order something else? And those are kind of the things that you have to know for step two. So kind of the resources that I use for step two. And mind you, um, when you take step two, you're usually in your third or fourth year or recently graduated. Um, some of my friends, actually, they, um, you know, they, they still haven't taken step two and they're still going to, they take it a couple months later. Um, the best one for that is honestly UWorld. Um, you know, UWorld is, especially as UAG students, we're not taking shelf exams. So we, we don't really know when we start studying for step two, we have no idea what the questions are, right? UX students are taking shelf exams so they know what questions and what the step two is gonna be like. So that UWorld is gonna kind of open your eyes and be like, Whoa, so this is what step two cares about. This is definitely way different than step one. So you can kind of start thinking, how do I study for step two? Um, what I also really like for step two um, is I like the first aid step two. Um, kind of because um, it's basically just 
a list of all the workups and all the algorithms. Hey, this is so-and-so disease. This is how it presents. This is what you're gonna do first. This is what you're gonna do second. If this happens, you're going to do that. And so it was really easy to kind of read through and be like, this is what I needed. And I kind of just made note cards of those workups so I could quiz myself on them. Um, Firecracker is also really good for step two. It also has some questions. Um, Anki decks are really good. Um, I also use Deja Review for step two. Um, another video is that you're gonna watch for step two, which are amazing, right? These are what US students swear by. It's called Online Meta. It's completely free. I don't know if maybe you've watched some of those videos, but it's completely And it is like the Bible for step two. He goes through all the common diseases, how to diagnose them, what your workup is. And so you just watch that and you're like, okay, this is it. This is what you do here. This is what you're gonna see. This is what you do for this complication. And that's really beneficial, not only for step two, but also watching those on your rotations. Yes, um, actually, um, I wanted to ask you about online method for step two. Is it broken up by specialty? And do you think that would be beneficial to watch it throughout rotations? Oh, I so it is broken up by specialty. It'll be like cardiology, pulmonology, um, OBGYN, uh, critical care, surgery. Um, and honestly, I didn't, I didn't really dive into that until I was studying for step two, but I wish I would have been watching those during my rotations because it would have given me a lot of really good answers or knowing a lot of ideas for pimp questions because you're going to get a lot of pimp questions on your rotations. In terms of practice exams, did you also use NBMEs? Are there NBMEs for step two? Yep. So. Um, what I did is I did MBME is and I did uh, UWorld, the UWorld uh, exam, and I absolutely hated them. Absolutely hated them. I, they, whenever you take an MBME, it just crushes you. For some reason, very few people do well on MBME. So I would take one and I'd be like, ah. Oh. Um, my UWorld averages were were pretty good, but what I was getting on MBMEs was right here, and so. Um, they were not fun, so I ended up taking a step and I did, I scored about what my UWorld averages said, right? I did bad on, I did bad on MDMEs. I think I just got so stressed out and I'm taking them and I'm tired and you're drinking coffee at Starbucks on that street or in the library, I don't know. But I actually did, I did much better on the actual test than I had on any of my MDMEs. Um, so I trusted my U world averages. And as far as um, step two went, um, when it came to step two, I actually did not take any MBMEs. I did not take any diagnostic tests because they got me down. I said, I know I'm going to pass. I know I will pass this exam. I do not care what I get. As long as I get an okay score, I'll be happy with family medicine in Iowa, wherever, wherever. Um, so I just kind of, trusted my U world averages and I just stuck my head down and I kept going and I said for step two whatever I get I get and so yeah I did, did all right on step two so that's very important always trying to think of the next step which is for you fellowship even though you you haven't started your residency yet but I love it I love that you're already thinking ahead uh, it feels good once you I will say this you guys as, as UAG students you're gonna feel this you always kind of feel like you have a chip on the shoulder like people like Oh, those are like the second best medical students, right? Everyone gets it, you get it, you know? When you're a resident, that doesn't matter. No one cares, you're a resident physician. There's no international resident physicians, there's no this. It's like, hey, I matched into internal medicine at Brooklyn Hospital in New York City. Oh, cool, where'd you go to medical school? UAG. I do not care anymore, I'm like, listen, I am on this side, I have made it that chip on your shoulder falls off. Yeah, yeah. And then you kind of wear Mexico as a badge of honor. It's like, no, dude, I was in Mexico. Like, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so in terms of ECFMG certification, were you um, certified before submitting your ERAS application? So, actually wasn't, actually wasn't. I, I totally like thought I was good with the ECFMG and then it's like, uh-oh. I got an email in like November saying, you need to certify within with the ECFMG before December 15th 
in order to be eligible for the match. And I was like, <gasps> so no. I paid the $80. I emailed the school. I was like, hey, can you verify? And then I was able to continue in the match. But Oh, awesome. So it wasn't, um, it didn't take that long to finish the process. No, I think it was all of like four days. Oh, okay. Because at that point you already had your step one, CK and your OET or no? Yep. So, yep. Yep. So I had, um, technically you only need step one to apply for a match. Um, and I know some friends who did that back when it was scored. Um, but yeah, so you're already in the system in order to take step one, you've got to get like an ECFMG ID number and they've got to get your credentials. So by the time you actually do go to match, they've already got most of your information and they just need your final transcripts. I wanted to ask you, I mean, you successfully matched, so I'm not sure how much you would know, but just in case, um, yeah. what do you know about SOAP and the scramble process? Yep. Um, so I knew a couple people that had to do it and it's, um, thank God I didn't like. <laughs> that is, I was, I remember losing sleep Sunday night thinking, I might have to soap this next week. I might have to scramble. So what happens is um, I think this year, 95% of the programs were filled by match day or by, by the start of match week. So 95% of the available programs that everyone was interviewing for had filled up. So that meant that everyone who didn't match, which means um, they interviewed places and all the places they interviewed were like, we have other people we prefer before you. Um, they have to start the process over again. It's basically like you send out your application to programs. You're like, hey, can I get an interview with you guys? Um, and then um, if you, there's like a couple rounds, I think, remember reading. So it's like Monday you apply, Tuesday you interview, you find out if you made it or not. Then you do the process again, interview, find out if you made it into one of those. And I think by the time Friday rolls around, like 99.9% .9 of programs, and there's very few unfilled spots. But I hear it's very stressful. You do not want to soap. You do not want to scramble. Um, but some people do, and people find programs. And some people actually prefer soap because, like, I got to choose the program. Like, as soon as I interviewed, I could say, I'll go with them or not. So. True, true. Uh, in terms of applying, how, how many schools did you apply to? Um, I ended up um, ranking, what is that, four programs, um, which is way less, right? I should have interviewed at more places. And one of them was, uh, my last one was a fail-safe. I applied to a family medicine program in Nebraska because I thought, hey, this is my, I'd rather be a doctor in family medicine, community medicine, which is fun, than not be a doctor and wait. So, but luckily I got into my top choice. So did you apply to um, four programs total? No, so I actually applied to like 96 programs, right? Um, and they kind of say, especially as an international, you want to apply to about 100 programs. Um, and then based off of that, how, how strong your resume is, well, or how good it is, or which programs you wanted to, or which specialty will determine what, how many interviews you get. How did you find what programs to apply for? Yep. Uh, so, um, so when you're looking and when you're in your third years, um, or when you're looking for where you want to do your rotations, find a spot that has that, that residency available because contacts are huge, right? Um, so I applied to a lot of programs in Texas, California, Florida, and Nebraska, um, because I thought, Hey, this is where my Spanish can work. It's warm weather. And um, so where I matched into, one of my friends was actually a current resident there. And so he actually um, went to the program director and was like, hey, I have a buddy. This is his application number. You should look at his application. And so, I mean, I'm from Nebraska, so New York really has no reason. It's like, hey, why does this kid want to come to New York? Nope. But my friend was like, hey, give this guy a second. You know, hey, give this guy his resume. And so... Um, he definitely got me the interview there, right? So contacts can definitely get you. If you know friends who match and they said, you're awesome, that might be a foot in your door where they say, hey, we're not gonna vouch for everyone, but we'll tell the program coordinator to, to look at yours. So that's how I got one of them. 
and the others, um, El Paso is very IMG friendly. Um, a lot of Texas, um, the internal medicine um, program director was actually from Guadalajara. He was a Mexican, he studied at UDG. Um, so when I interviewed with him, he was like, um, oh, I'm from Guadalajara too, da da da. Um, so kind of like, you've got to think what places are going to be, some places don't like international students. Some places don't take international students. Um, some places, New York, Texas, Florida, California, um, especially where they're Spanish speaking, they're more open to taking IMGs. Yeah, so, you know, and if you know a doctor you get an LOR from, he might tell you, hey, apply to my program and I'll vouch for you. If you score this on step two, you'll interview at our program. So um, not only can you get LORs, but sometimes doctors can like you enough to say, I want you in this residency program. And you even hear about people who are like, there's no way I should have matched into that program, but I rotated there and they liked me. And that's, at the end of the day, these people are gonna be working with you in the next three or four years. So they wanna get good people. Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. Um, okay, so now that you've gone through the MAC, how important do you believe UAG grades are your first and second year for matching? What they'll do is UAG has your, um, your, um, uh, your they'll send like your, your grades, your grades, right? So it'll be like, hey, here's, you got an eight on neuro, you got a nine on this block. Um, they're kind of not irrelevant, but they're, they're kind of lower on the totem pole of things that are important. Like the first thing is, what are your step scores? What are your LORs? Like, I think most of those program directors, they don't know what a nine at UHG means. They have no idea how many people scored those, um, how many people get sevens. So they look at it and they, how do I interpret this? You know, and they're just like, oh, looks good, you know? Yeah, okay, okay. And with that said, um, so do you believe that third year grades, quote unquote, matter more? So I'm trying to think if we got graded on those or not, or if it was just, those are the credit hours on it. Um, I would think more than your grades, it's more your LORs, you know, like, and it's gonna, and the thing that you're gonna learn is that every program director kind of values some things other than others. Maybe you apply to El Paso and he's seen 50 UAG grads and he's like, this person didn't have good grades. And that might be a strike against you. But I think for more program directors, um, especially since we don't have like shelf exams or, you know, graduate with honors, without honors, you know, like if it says five, 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 fail, 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 that's not going to look good for you. Um, but I think in the grand scheme of what are the most important things, I would put UAG grades. In my opinion, I think UAG grades are probably towards the bottom of what are important, you know, outside of did you fail a semester, that would obviously be, be a red mark, but. You mentioned actually letters of recommendation. So. Um, you got a total of four letters of recommendation, is that correct? So, no, no, I wished I had four LORs. Um, so what you can do is, um, I think as soon as you're in rotations, you can make an ERAS account, right? Okay. And so I would recommend, um, so that's, uh, um, I can't remember if it's like a year before, if you're fourth year, but at some point in time, before you're actually applying, you can pay like $50 and open your application and start working on it. And why I would say do that is, um, at least in my opinion, I had a couple doctors who said they would write letters of recommendation for me. I emailed them, was like, hey, oh yeah, we will. Okay, here's the form. And you know, they, they just, doctors are busy. Um, whereas I think if you have that application in that form, and you say, here it is right after your rotation, they're more willing to write it. They put it in the system and it's stayed for when you apply. That would be my advice, or at least in my opinion, you know, I did have doctors write LORs, um, but there were also a couple who said they would and then never ended up doing it, so. So how many um, letters did you get? I had two letters of recommendation. I thought I was good. I was like, oh, I have four doctors who say they're gonna write it. And then it turned out only be being two doctors. Well, thank you for sharing. So when did you ask for them and how did you go about it? At the end of your rotation, and this is what I think most students do, they're just like, or towards the end of it in your last couple of days, it's like, hey doc, um, you know, if you think I did a good job, would you be willing to write me a letter of recommendation to help me match? And 95% of the time they're gonna say yes. 
you know. Um, but in the same note, if you didn't rock star rotation, you might want to think because he's gonna, you know, probably worse than no letter of recommendation is a subpar letter of recommendation. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, my next question would be regarding um, your hobby section in ERAS. Um, can you tell us more about it and what did you put? Your hobby section is kind of, this is kind of your chance to be you, right? So in residency, right, they're kind of, they're looking for who do I want to be with? You know, once you make it to the interview, you're smart enough to be in that program. They said you are a good enough candidate to be in our program. What the interview is for is kind of, you know, who are you as a person? Do I want to be your coworker? Do I think you'd represent the hospital well? Um, so as far as hobbies go, I just kind of wrote what I, I was interested in. You know, I put, um, I'm a big cyclist. I love bicycles. I love bicycles. It's great for the health. Um, so I wrote that. I was like, I love to cycle. And I um, actually, I cycled, uh, I'm a bicycle commuter. So I would ride to the, my bike to the hospitals, right? And so I got to talk about that. Um, they're going to bring those up in your interview. You know, they're going to be like, so you're a cyclist. How is that? Or, oh, um, you have cats. You said you like cats. You know, how are your cats doing? Um, so that's kind of your hobbies or your way to kind of let them know, hey, kind of who is this person and what are things that we can talk about in the interview or what makes this person interesting? Awesome. That's really cool. Did you put about your cats? I can't remember. I can't. I, I either put them in as hobby or I wrote about them um, in the essay. I put them, I think I did put them in my, my hobbies. Oh. Um, I think my hobbies were... I put cycling, sports, golf, and I think I put guitar. And, uh, but yeah, just, it's kind of like, I mean, your hobbies don't even really matter. They're really irrelevant. It's just like, hey, you know, think of it like, um, think of it like a hinge, a hinge account, right? It's like, hey, what are you writing? It's like, okay, this is something that we can start a conversation up with them. So in terms of, I guess, what truly matters in terms of writing, your personal statement, um, how did you, go about writing it so I actually don't know if mine was good or bad you know like you know I got in so like I don't but I don't know if it helped me or hurt me but um kind of your personal statement there's a handful of schools of thought on this you know I think like 99% of them are just like boring you know like they say the same thing like you know hey um I wanted to be you know an ER doctor because of this I did this rotation I did these things um, but I was reading a book and it, there's like, uh, it's like 200 tips for matching or something. It's like a red book, but it's like um, kind of the match process and things. And kind of, he said, your, your essay is your chance for you to stand out. Your essay is for you to say, why do you want to do this specialty? And why should this specialty choose you? And so I kind of, when I wrote my essay, I kind of like, I kind of want to give this more of a, a personal story feel. Um, so I kind of, what I did is I kind of had an intro, you know, a quick of what my background was, what growing up was. Um, my parents didn't have a lot of money. I got free and reduced lunch, you know? So like a lot of UAG students were kind of the trailblazers or were the first people in our families, a lot of us, trying to get into to medicine. Um, and I wrote about my experience in Puerto Rico and how it was tough studying. And then the last half of my essay, I really focused on why internal medicine? why I would be good for the program, why I felt I would be a good fit, why I was a good worker, what doctors said about me. Um, you know, I would just say when you get to that point, um, just, you know, um, either get a book that talks about what good essays are or kind of what the essays who are getting people matched are writing. Because um, it's kind of your chance to really tell your story and get them interested. Does this, does your essay pique their curiosity? Does their thing think, wow, this actually is a really good candidate? Or are you just another bland essay to where there it does, there's like, okay, this is just like everybody else. This doesn't do, this doesn't help or hurt this applicant's, you know, thing. And they ask you about those, you know, they ask you about like, um, I had so many people ask me about organic chemistry in Puerto Rico in my interviews, you know? <laughs> That's cool. Um, they're like, how is doing it in Spanish? And I was like, horrible, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of go with, just be yourself. Let who you are come through that. Let your inspiration, your, your desire for medicine kind of come out in your essay and you'll kind of figure it out. And then ask other people what they think. 
you know, and I think you'll get there. But as far as essays go, that's probably, by that point in time, you've killed step one, you've killed step two. The essay part isn't quite that that bad. Thanks for sharing of what you included in your personal statement. Um, yeah, I haven't started thinking about that, but it's not until now where, um, you know, so many successful stories of matching. So I'm like, okay, yes, I know that. Uh, this is what's included and this is what's a priority. So thank you for that. Um, Sometimes it's fun to daydream about residency. You know, it's fun. It's like, oh man, it's going to be like this. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Um, is there anything that we have talk, have not talked about that we that was included in your ERAS? No, I think those are honestly the big one. There is um, some programs and I heard that there, I've heard some rumors that they're going to expand this. Um, so I think they're going to stick with Zoom interviews. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's e easier for programs because they don't have to spend a whole day and it's less money for applicants. The problem is, is that now everyone's applying everywhere. Um, so programs um, trying to figure out how do we deal with this, um, they're doing like supplemental. So you do your ERAS and then they'll have a supplemental section and what internal medicine and i believe surgery was the other specialty i could be wrong on that you get like oh i can't remember if it's like you get 10 programs and it's called like a super touch or something it sounds really cheesy but basically or like a reach out right but it, it basically lets you oh he's making his his way on it lets you choose like 15 programs where you would really like to go mm. and then you can Basically, it gives them a notification. Hey, this person applied to you and they also really want to go there. And because you can only do it to like 10 programs, they know this applicant is really interested in my program. And not that you can't get a, a interview without that, um, but if you're doing internal medicine or surgery, that definitely kind of lets the program know this person really, really wants to come here rather than I was just one more click on the box. Um, wait, so is this something that was happening when you applied? I think I can, it was either this year, I think it was this year or last match year where they now have supplemental. Um, but they're complete, they say they're completely optional. Like you don't have to do this, but if you don't, it's like, why didn't you? So. Yeah, so did you, did you do some supplemental questions? So I actually had a nightmare on seven. So this is the thing too, you are gonna have nightmares. You're gonna have nightmares. You're gonna have, no one has a perfect match cycle, right? And this is my hiccup, right? Okay. I was so exhausted from getting the residency. I opened the email and I must have looked at the wrong date or remembered the wrong date. I thought I had like two extra days to do it. So I was like, okay, it's due on the 21st. It's actually due on the like 19th. And so I went there and I was like, no. So I actually did not, I so I did not do the supplemental and I matched and I got interviews in internal medicine. But I should have done it, but that was my, that was my scare for the match cycle. That's terrifying. Okay, question about that. What, were you given an email regarding all of the places like at once or is it kind of like, oh, this school would like for you to do a supplemental or, or how does that work? I'm, I'm a little iffy on the process. Uh, so you're, it'll close. It'll say, okay, this is last day. Then right after that, they're like, okay, now the supplemental is open. And so you click on the link for it. You go in the supplemental, you have like three days to do it, three or four days to do it or something. And then you have to turn that in. And then all internal medicine programs, for instance, I, if, if I would have done the internal medicine supplemental, they then would have had my main one and it would have sent the supplemental to every program that I've applied to up to that point. Oh, okay. So it's a general question regarding probably like your, your specialty and then they'll give it to all the programs that you applied to. Yep. So it's just like more further in-depth questions. Like, mm -hmm. would you like to give us any more hobbies? Would you like to give us any more volunteering experience? Would you like to give us any more research experience? Tell us more about internal medicine, you know, choose 10 programs that you'd really like to go to. What region of the country would you want to live in? So oh. I definitely, it was definitely something I should have done and I was going to do. And that was my, that was my match scare. You know, I was like, no. Nah. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you for that. I have never heard of this, so thank you for it's that. It's a new thing and I've heard they're expanding it, so. 
if you're not surgery or internal medicine, you're fine. But if you're gonna do IM, it's gonna be exciting and probably the other specialties too. Oh, okay, okay. So surgery and IM are doing this. Yeah. I mean, I know it's IM because I applied to internal medicine, but I think I heard someone say surgery was the other one, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay, okay, no worries. Thank you, thank you for that. Well, I wanted to ask you regarding um, interviews. How did you prepare for them? So as far as interviews go, I would just make sure you know your your everything that's on your application because they can ask you anything. Um, I, you know, I always interviewed pretty well. I knew that was like one of my strengths and actually my, my attendings would say, don't worry about step one, you have great bedside manner. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to take that. But, um, you know, it's basically just like a job interview and it's more relaxed. They're not going to pimp you. Like I was never, I was always afraid, like, are they going to try and pimp me? Are they going to be like, how do you test the trigeminal nerve when it's zero degrees? And I'd be like, I don't know, build a fire. You know, like, I didn't know, like, what are they going to ask you? Right. But no one pimped me. Like it was a very relaxed. It was more of all my interviews because think about it at the same time, they want to convince you to go there too. No program wants unfilled slots. So at the same time, you're kind of interviewing, being interviewed by them. They're also kind of trying to convince you to come to their program. So it, all my interviews, they were just like a really relaxed kind of get to know you. Like they would ask questions. Um, a lot of the doctors start out like, so tell me a bit about yourself. Hey, tell me a bit about yourself. Um, hey, I saw you are a cyclist. Tell me more about that. Oh, you, you did clinics in the poor countryside. Tell us how that worked. What patients did you see? What was it like? Um, so I wouldn't be scared of the interview because at that point in time, you know, it's, it's more of a, they want to know you, you know, don't think of like, oh my gosh, they're going to pimp me. They're going to ask me, you know, um, if this person has a, uh, cherry red macula and they're an infant and now they're having failure to thrive, what enzyme is going to be elevated? Like, no, like they're not going to like hit you with those because they probably have forgotten as well. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's a lot of like, Hey, this is our program or why do you want to come to this program? What interests you about the city? Why internal medicine? Or they might ask you, hey, how come you didn't have any letters of recommendation from Mexico? You know, things that they're curious about. So um, honestly, when you hit interviews, just think of it as like an awesome opportunity to meet everyone. You'll, they'll have, most programs will give you one day with the doctors and then another where you're just talking to residents. When you meet the doctors, is that part of your interview day? Yep, so as far as the online ones that are going, at least with the programs that I did, um, some of them broke it up so they're like hey wednesday night is optional meet the residents optional right you don't have to do this but um talking with the residents gives you a great idea of the program and residents tend to be a little bit more open with what they think you know hey this is what i think this is how the program is um and if they say they like you they might be like hey we really like this person um but then your interview day is where you're going to meet an interview with the current doctors the program director and those are the ones that kind of hold the most weight. Like if a resident likes you, but the doctors are like, this is a horrible person or a resident doesn't like you, but all of the program directors, they're probably going to put you high on their list. They're going to rank you high. Gotcha. Gotcha. In terms of creating your rank list, did you, do you have any strategies or did you use any strategies? My second one was El Paso. I loved it too. I would have been happy with either of my top twos. Um, and I, I luckily, 50% of people don't get their top choice. I was part of the 50% who I opened it and was like, yes, I, I got it. Um, the, so the first thing is like, would you want to be there? You know, would you want to live in El Paso? Would you want to live in New York? Would you want to live in Phoenix? Right. Um, and then when you're interviewing, you kind of get a feel, you know, kind of what you want to stay away from, or there, there are some toxic residencies out there. You know, there are unfortunately some residency programs that do not have a good culture and or maybe there's some places that have a great culture but you just don't feel that fit so when you're kind of talking to the doctors you'll kind of feel a fit um another thing you want to think about is like do you want to be in a community hospital or do you want to be in like an academic hospital um you know what or if you're family medicine do you want to be in a rural or do you want to be in an urban one? Um, if you're in an ER, do you want to be in a high volume one or a low volume one? One that's more academic or one that's more hands-on clinical? 
Um, and then another thing to think about is if you would like to continue on, right? Say you're family medicine, but you want to be a dermatologist, right? You're like, I want to just have a, a small derm clinic. Well, does your program have a dermatology fellowship for family medicine or are you going to have to go out? If you want to do cardiology, does your hospital have a cardiology fellowship or does it not? And one of the things is, is at that point in time, most hospitals want to choose their residents first. You know, not that you can't get a fellowship somewhere else, but it's like, hey, I know this person. They've trained with me for three years. I know them. I'd like to give it to them before looking at somebody. I have no idea who they are. In terms of your program, can you speak a little bit about what kind of program it is? Yeah. So, um, so it's an internal medicine. So I will be at the hospital getting yelled at by attendings for 80 hours. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, so. I need to reread but the curriculum, but it's kind of like doing your rotations all over again. So it's like, hey, you've got three weeks in the ICU, you've got three weeks in peds, you've got two weeks in clinic, um, but this time you're kind of, you're the resident. So you're kind of getting this. And then they say you need to do like academic articles or academic endeavors. I'll be at the hospital doing these rotations as a, you know, under a hospitalist, you know. Very similar to the internal medicine rotation you'll you'll have. Oh, okay. Um, now I know that this program exists and that we have a UEG alum over there. So, um, and I'm sure everyone looking at this video will probably look up this program as well. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you take <laughs> UEG students. <laughs> the new hotspot. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So we're basically near the end of our our, our video, and I just wanted to ask you. If you have any um, last remarks for UAG students. Yeah, very cool. Well, first off, UAG, I love you guys. You guys will find out that UAG, we're kind of a family. So no matter when you graduated or who you are, UAG students, we kind of stick together, you know? When always, when you guys are excited that you just mash, you know, go back and help out the people who helped me out, you know, the people that I reached out to. Like, can you guys do online, online interviews with us? Um, so I guess, I guess my advice for you guys, right, is first is you can do it, you, you know, um, some of you might not do it, you know, there are some that, you know, unfortunately, I think it's like half of UAG students aren't going to end up matching, right? Be the ones that match, be the ones that, that make it here and you can. I have tons of friends who match and don't worry if you mess up. Um, I know a girl who failed a semester, did not have the best step score and she matched into her top choice family medicine. Um, I think you guys might have seen a, I, I know there was an AMSA interview with me and my buddy Carlos, and he actually said he failed step one, right? Which is a huge red flag. So you don't have to have the perfect, app, and he mentioned the internal medicine too. You don't have to have the perfect application to match, you know? And if it says, if you're worried like, oh my gosh, it says I need a 230 to match an emergency medicine. Well, those are just averages, you know? Don't get too worked up over, the step is just a number. There's some programs like John Hopkins where you need to be the Einstein in order to get in. Whereas some of these other programs are a little bit easier to get in. You know, they might be like, hey, we're not quite up there with Hopkins. We'll take lower scores. You know, so that that number, that average, is just average. There's programs above it, below it. There's programs all over. Um, but kind of my advice for you guys, especially in your first two years for watch is be a sponge, right? You need to absorb everything that you can right something that i heard on and don't just memorize seek to understand seek to form uh links right if i tell you hey um um paresomite, right that trashes your 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 potassium right what do you think that's going to do to someone's cardiomyocytes if they took digoxin right right but digoxin no one uses that anymore it's just a, a, a board question right but is that going to have any effect on their mental status, right? Um, you know, learn to link things. Hey, if you have heart failure, what's that going to do to your intestines? Oh, do you think if you maybe have some atherosclerosis and you have heart disease, that might cause some ischemia, some stomach pain, maybe in a presentation? Hey, this person just got pregnant. What's that going to do to their clotting? What does estrogen affects on clotting? Ooh, what, what could possibly clot? And forming all those interconnections and understanding those and sponge everything. I heard people say, oh, that's not gonna be on the exam. You've gotta learn it. You know, medicine isn't just about what's on this UAG test. It's like, I guarantee you, you're gonna have to understand it on the step. 
it's going to help you. The more you can understand, the more you can learn um, is better. And don't just memorize. I know a lot of people who would be like, oh, I'm just going to memorize the PowerPoints and that's how I pass exams. It hurts them in year two and it hurts them for the step because they spent all medical school just trying to memorize things without understanding and it's easier to forget. Um, I wrote some stuff down, some thoughts. Um, yeah, just be a sponge, you know, be a sponge. Um, your UAG students, you can do it. You guys are bilingual. You have that huge advantage and enjoy your time. You get to third year, really just enjoy the medicine. Like, I know it's really stressful year one and year two and everyone's ready to get out there. Third year's a blast. You're gonna get to third year. You're finally gonna be in the hospital. You're not killing your mind all day, reading, reading, watching videos. Um, so you're almost there. Third year's a blast, fourth year's a blast. Enjoy it, learn everything you can. Uh, because someday you guys are gonna be doctors taking care of people, you know? So you can definitely be there, you know? And there's tons of, don't look at yourself as worse because you're a UHG student. There's tons of, there's tons of US students who didn't get their top program because UAG students beat them out for it. I know friends who matched into surgery at the University of Georgia. You know, I know friends who matched into um, internal medicine at the University of Western Carolina School of Medicine, you know? So you, you're gonna have that chip on your shoulder. Doctors might be like, oh, that's an international student, but you know what? We beat out US students. There's tons that wish they could get into the program that UAG students do. And when you become a resident, it doesn't matter where you went to medical school. Um, and I'll just leave you guys with this. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, if you guys are ever curious about internal medicine or how the process works, I am always an open door for UAG students. You know, so no question is too dumb. I might not get back to it for a while, but I will, I will put it on my um, need to do list, so. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your time for today, but also um, for opening up your your chat. Essentially, I'll put your um, handle on on the description box below of this video. And um, I really appreciate all of the advice and how open you were about your experience throughout. You know, UAG rotations, ERAS application. I know that it's like a tough journey but you made it and we're all rooting for you and we really really do see you know I personally love seeing UAG alum make it and so now that I know that you made it now I'm like okay New York is a possibility uh, I am you know it's 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 beautiful to see you thrive and also I wish you the best of luck in um, your residency I know you're gonna have lots of fun I love your energy and I'm sure they're gonna love you over there and the best of luck in everything that you do. Awesome, good luck to you as well. Enjoy third year to all my UAG family. You are almost there. When, when you make it, it is worth it. Just keep trucking, put that head down. Don't get too stressed out. You're gonna have ups and downs. Downs happen, ups happen. Just keep on going, but awesome. Thank you for okay. the uh, warm wishes and good luck on the studies. Thank you, thank you. Adios. <laughs>